Today we're looking at an absolutely beautiful article by Kevin Corb written in 2003 that questions and does a mighty good job about it wherever traditional logical fallacies are actually fallacious. Yeah, some pretty strong and good stuff ahead. Initially, the article points out that formal deductive logic has been championed as the normative standard with which to analyse arguments made in everyday language. But this might not be the best way to look at things. For instance, everyday arguments seem to vary in their degree of strength, while formal deductive logic evaluates them only based on a dichotomy, whether the argument made is valid or invalid. There seems to be a mismatch here. Moreover, and I quote directly from the article, the status of logical fallacies has always been a central and controversial issue for informal logic. In fact, when dealing with claims and arguments in natural language, we notice that interpretation issues can crop up quite frequently. To exemplify, say someone says in response to some argument, a person who spoke for argument is a liar, a filthy liar then we would be dealing with a classical version of the ad hominem fallacy. The person who is levying the liar accusation is attacking the character of a person making the argument instead of addressing the substance of the argument itself. This is classically regarded as a fallacy because the character of a person making the argument is irrelevant with respect to whether the argument is valid or not. But... There is another way to pass the statement uh, the person who spoke for argument is a liar from natural language, and that is as an inductive claim referring to probabilities of belief. The more charitable reading then could be something like If an unknown third party would have given this argument, I would evaluate its chance of being true at X. Since you a liar gave this argument, I evaluate its chance of being true at less than x. Indeed, the fact that one is a liar reduces prima facie the probability that his claims or premises will be true, and by consequence that his conclusion will be true, irregardless of the merits of his argument. Nothing really groundbreaking here. Uh, if we think about it. Uh, for instance, in courts, we all know that it is standard practice to consider the reliability of witnesses by questioning their character. As Corb himself puts it, the impulse to discount these forms of argument as fallacy appears to stem from an over-idolized view of argumentation, one where the merits of every argument can be assessed in abstraction from all context. In the real world, the considerations of time and circumstance are inescapable, and ignoring the reliability of witnesses is simply irresponsible. Just to drive a point home, if a compulsive liar is trying to convince a friend of yours about something, it is probably a good heuristic to tell your friend, uh, oh, by the way, you're talking with a compulsive liar, as a way to signal to him to not waste his time dissecting whatever argument was just thrown at him. The merit of the ad hominem in this case lies in the fact that in a practical setting, uh, we have finite time and finite capacities. So it's probably a good uh, rule to screen some arguments with preliminary information. Hmm, interesting. When analysing the ad hominem fallacy, there seems to be a tension between a deductive interpretation and an inductive interpretation of the fallacy. But maybe this just happens with the ad hominem fallacy. But no, Kevin Corb, beautiful alliteration, tells us that even some of the most blatant logical fallacies can be framed in a similar manner. The exquisite and primary contribution the article makes is that one can find a unifying theory to defend many informal logical fallacies, and that such a unifying theory is traced by shifting the understanding of logical fallacies from the deductive sphere to the inferential sphere, the realm of probabilities. Take the appeal to popularity. The appeal to popularity fallacy is made 
when an argument relies on public opinion to determine what is true. This approach is classically considered problematic because popularity does not necessarily indicate that something is true. Uh, deductively speaking, uh, the conclusion of some argument isn't true just because everybody believes it is true. But notice that if we take a more charitable reading of an appeal to popularity, it may sound like an inferential claim regarding the veracity of an argument. It may go something uh, like this. In general, people recognize true facts. The majority of people think that a certain fact is true. Therefore, I have preliminary evidence to believe that that certain fact is true myself. Again, by changing our perspective from the deductive to the inductive domain, we see that the fallacy might not be so fallacious after all. Now, okay, so let's really try to test this framework by taking one of the most blatant of fallacies, affirming the consequent. Affirming the consequent takes an assumed conditional and instead of applying it to the asserted truth of its antecedent, as in modus ponens, it attempts to reverse the process. As in, all humans are mortal, Socrates is dead, therefore Socrates is human. Corb goes on to explain that, despite being the most blatant of fallacies and disparaged in popular texts on logic, this form of argument is pervasive in the sciences. And he gives an example. If evolutionary theory is true, we would expect to find antibiotic-resistant strains of bacterial disease appearing. We do find that, so indeed, evolutionary theory is true. To better understand why this inference makes sense, it is useful to know a fundamental proposition of a probability known as Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule states that the probability of some hypothesis given the evidence is equal to the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis, all divided by the probability of the evidence. This is a true uncontroversial theorem regarding how probabilities function. Applied to our example, say we thought the chances of evolutionary theory being true were only 50%, and then we were presented the evidence that we saw antibiotic-resistant strains of bacterial disease appearing. We would then like to find our updated probabilities of evolutionary theory being true, given the evidence we have just been presented. To do so, we need to think about the ratio of the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis over the probability of the evidence. We know that the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis should be high. We would in fact expect to see antibiotic-resistant bacteria appearing if the theory of evolution was true. While the probability that we saw bacteria mutating to become antibiotic-resistant, if the theory of evolution wasn't true, would certainly be lower than if it were true. In other words, the probability of the evidence must be less than the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis. So the ratio of the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis over the probability of the evidence must be greater than 1. Thus, from Bayes' rule, our updated probability of evolutionary theory being true, given the piece of evidence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria appearing, must certainly be more than our initial estimate of a probability of evolutionary theory being true, that was 50%. Given the evidence, we should be more inclined to believe in the theory of evolution. This is a coherent and quite sophisticated inferential argument. It can be considered a charitable way, or perhaps the best way, to pass the affirming the consequent fallacy we have been considering. Corb certainly thinks so. Affirming the consequent is emphatically not a fallacy. It is a central feature of scientific inference, in fact, quite properly deserving its special title as inference to the best explanation. Now that the deductive view and the inductive view have been presented, 
we could go on with other examples. But I think you get the point. Uh, there are some informal fallacies that if you interpret inferentially, they seem much more reasonable. Before concluding, it must be said that Korb frames his entire defense of uh, informal logical fallacies as best encapsulated by a Bayesian um, inferential framework uh, that I have only utilized at the end. So if one wants uh, more rigor and all the details, you can check out the link in the description below where uh, you can uh, see the full article.